there will be this, uh, uh, the organization of the time will be a panel discussion at the beginning with, uh, uh, and then with uh, questions uh, from the audience to follow. When we get to the Q&A, please keep your questions uh, to the topic of today's forum, uh, namely innovation and economic growth. Um, in an effort to be brief, thus uh, maximizing our time for discussion, I offer the following observations uh, on our panel this evening. Uh, tonight we have uh, four eminent leaders with four distinguished backgrounds. Uh, first, our moderator is an eminent journalist. Um, you know, all know him. Uh, he's now with Bloomberg for some period of time, uh, but uh, also I think for four decades was involved with the Wall Street Journal in a very prominent way. So um, next, um, I mentioned John Hennessy. Uh, John Hennessy is my boss at uh, Stanford University. Uh, he's ten, uh, Stanford's 10th president, uh, and he has been uh, just a terrific uh, leader uh, of the university for la a fair number of years now and uh, has been a terrific, um, in, has had a terrific impact and influence. Uh, he is um, also, uh, his background is technology and he's very much uh, an intellectual in this regard uh, but he's become even a broader much more broader intellectual as time has gone on next I mentioned Paul Ryan uh, Paul Ryan uh, is a US congressman as you all know uh, he's the um, uh, he represents Wisconsin he's chairman of the House Budget Committee he's a senior member of the House Ways and Means Committee uh, which has jurisdiction over tax policy, uh, social security, health care, and trade laws. Um, he is uh, uh, just a wonderful, terrific political uh, leader and uh, public leader, and um, uh, was the vice presidential nominee in the last uh, presidential election, and uh, uh, hopefully better days are, even better days are to come. Uh, and finally, uh, John Taylor, my colleague uh, at Stanford University. Uh, John is a senior fellow at, uh, uh, at the Hoover Institution as well as professor of economics at Stanford. Uh, he's uh, uh, very much an awarded economist. He's uh, an incredibly uh, hot property these days on economics and economic policy. And so that is our lineup tonight. And with that, Al, I turn it over to you. Great, John. Uh, thank you. Can everybody hear? Um, I'll just add a little bit. Uh, Paul Ryan is a very, uh, is a very much discussed and controversial issue these days. The question, the question is, will he be a the next Republican presidential candidate? B, the next chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, or C, the next Speaker of the House? Uh, Paul says, why not combine all three? I mean, he can just kind of, you know, exactly. John, John Taylor, uh, anybody who covered the Romney campaign last time and talked to them about what they would do if they won, it was almost a foregone conclusion that John would have been the next chairman of the Federal Reserve Board under a Romney-Ryan administration. John, just be patient. You may want to reverse the order of the administration, <laughs> but in a couple of years, uh, the, uh, you know, the call may come. But I love it when an economist is called a hot topic. I mean, that yeah, really yeah, shows you where yeah, we are. Hot property. <laughs> hot property. John Hennessy, you have done so much at Stanford, not least of which is now that, that, that school up in Cambridge is referred to as the Stanford of the East. And I think that's, uh, but I want to give you one warning. I've read about your Rose Bowl football team and about your NCAA men's and women's basketball team and all the other great athletic achievements at your uh, fabulous university. I want to remind you that it wasn't too long ago the Swarthmore College won 20 straight football games and the faculty demanded a meeting and a review which resulted in terminating college athletics for football at Swarthmore. <laughs> so watch that faculty carefully there. Uh, this is a, obviously the Hoover uh, Institute and uh, Stanford believe in intellectual affirmative action, which is why I'm here with this panel. Uh, and let me, let me just throw out some ideas, and you, you all can talk among yourselves, and then we'll leave time for questions at the end. Uh, President Hennessy, let me start with you. You've spoken of an innovation deficit, uh, and there have been important 
federal uh, contributions or starts to innovation, DARPA and the Internet, and some years ago, I think there was a $4.5 million National Science Foundation grant to two Stanford University graduates who, who had um, who, who, who'd come up with something, that, uh, a great new search engine, uh, which ended up being called Google. Right. Uh, so my question to you is, are we under-investing in federal R&D now, or is it a case of allocation, and what would you do differently? Well, I, I think, Al, the danger is that um, you know, the, the R&D percentage comes out of that small piece of discretionary budget. And our real danger as a country is if we can't tame the growth of entitlement spending, then the pressure to cut that discretionary spending. And what we're really worried about is an extended period where the growth of funding for, for research, but also for education, right, a key component of that, would be subinflation for some extended period of time. And you think about this 10 or 20 years, and all of a sudden, the U.S. could move from being the innovation leader, from being the place that has the best research universities, to a place that would find itself in second place, uh, particularly with the increases that are occurring in our, in, in our competition in Asia. That's the macro look. Are we spending our R&D money wisely? I think we can, you know, there's always room for improvement here. There's always room for improvement. The good news about the U.S. is that our system for giving out R&D money is based on peer review and, and meritocracy. And th this is quite different, though, from what ha often happens in Europe, where lots of other factors come in to influence. And I think it's important to keep that so that the best researchers continue to get, to get funded. Now, uh, you know, a peer-based merit review system, it makes mistakes occasionally. It's not perfect. But I think it is the system that steers the money to the best opportunities. John Taylor is a famed free market economist. What are the major ways that you think the government stifles innovation, or what changes? What are the major changes you'd like to see to have a more innovation-friendly public policy? I think policy? that we've seen more and more, especially in the last few years, increase in, in regulations <clears> of all kinds. I think the basic idea I teach my students about regulation or government intervention in general, it should pass a cost-benefit test. And I think for the most part, our, our, our regulations are not doing that. The costs are much greater than the benefits, as far as I can see. And some agencies don't even do that calculation publicly, like the Federal Reserve, for example. So it makes the financial market regulations quite high uh, and quite uh, creates obstructions. I think that my, my view, you say free market. I'm, I am a free market economist, but as I think most economists really are down inside. And so that means you want to have government encouraging research by really not picking winners and losers. Uh, and that means funding basic research, the, the research that has the most externalities. I think if you look at the uh, trends in research in the last years, it's moved more toward like funding more applied research. I don't know, maybe John can comment on that or, or Paul, but it seems to me in a way from the basic research. I think that's a mistake. I think the more we can provide basic research where there's a lot of spillovers and a lot of what economists call externalities, the better, and, uh, and that means shying away from the ones that you're picking winners and losers. And I just have to say, I just completely agree with this idea that our transfer payments, our entitlement spending is crowding out a lot of what government normally does, and that includes uh, funding for, for research, NSF, for example. Um, you mentioned monetary policy. I might just say, you know, the so-called Taylor Rule was, uh, was developed in Silicon Valley. It was funded by the National Science Foundation originally. So uh, mm -hmm. and it was basic research. No, I didn't say I wanted to do this particular thing. It was basic research. Does the, do, do the Fed policies stifle innovation? I know you have, you know, that you are critical of some of their monetary policies, but does it have an impact on innovation? I would say that what the Fed policies do now, because they're quite interventionist in particular markets, they uh, override how some of the markets are working, the, the short-term money market, for example, or even the bond market where there's lots of purchases. It makes price discovery harder so the markets don't work as well. And uh, that certainly affects uh, all the things that prices do in a system. I think here is really where the regulations like Dodd-Frank come into play more than monetary policy per se, because there's just been a slew of new regulations, some of which have not even been written down yet. And, and that, no question, that's got to, you're, everybody's spending huge amounts of time trying to figure out what the regulations are, how to comply with them, how to abide with them. And that, that definitely stifles innovation. You know, it's, it, 
unfortunately, it's very hard to measure the costs of, of these regulations. Um, and that's probably why we have so many of them. It's just really hard to, to convince people this is really costly. This is, uh, you know, you're, we're hiring more and more people to do compliance and not to do inventions or innovations, and, and that's a real problem. John, I know this may be apropos of not much, but uh, Chairman Bernanke was a great baseball fan. He went to the Washington Nationals, and they had him come down to watch batting practice about a year ago, and the manager introduced him to Jason Wirth, the $16 million a year right fielder. He said, Jason, this is Chairman Bernanke, the Federal Reserve, and Wirth said, I'd like to talk to you about QE3, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when we pay baseball players a lot. Paul Ryan, yeah. I know it's going to pain you, but let's talk about taxes. All right. uh -huh. Uh -huh. Particularly talk about corporate taxes. What impact does corporate tax do, do the corporate taxes have on on encouraging or, or stifling uh, innovation <clears throat> and, and I guess to, to give a double-edged question uh, corporate tax reform there are so few areas that, that, that you have any agreement with Barack Obama here's one place where he said all right let's take it down to 28 Dave Camp says let's take the top rate to 25 why can't the House do that why can't we get that done 26 and a half <clears throat> well first of all I think this is the first um uh, panel discussion I've been, been involved in where you have audience participation where the audience was invited to attend a full free wet bar for an hour before. <laughs> the event so, Boy, does that make the uh, questions better. Hour here. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, second, uh, I agree with the, what these two gentlemen said about, about, about entitlements. Uh, he's right about research. If you don't do it the meritocracy route, the peer review route, it will be applied and it will be crony capitalism. It will, it will, it will be political interference. Um, to tax reform. Uh, so it, there's a little bit more detail than just what you put in your, your question there, uh, Al. Um, yes, it's true the president has, has said he wants to go to a 28% rate. We see that as a great step in the right direction. We're at 25, not far from there. Um, why this issue? It's because we're losing our competitiveness. Capital is so much more mobile now than it was just a decade ago. And so, you know, the, the word inversion is becoming kind of a household word now. This is something we've been talking about for years. <clears throat> and the international average tax rate among industrialized nations is 25%. We're at 35%. And yes, some through loopholes and things that they can do in the tax code can get their effective rate down. But new businesses, investment decisions, uh, lots of manufacturing businesses and other kinds of businesses that create a lot of our jobs are at 35%. So it puts us at a huge competitive disadvantage. And now you see more and more companies inverting. And I think I can say this publicly because they told me I could. I talked to a, a board member of, of a world-class Medtronic, uh, world-class medical device company the other day. And they are proposing to invert so that they can get the $10 billion of capital they have overseas and bring it back into the country. So it's an American company that wants to bring back their money, which they can't now because of American tax laws, and they're going to become a foreign company in order to do that? That's crazy. So this is a problem. So to get to your question is, um, the administration has a different view on how the tax base is measured and the system we would have. We believe we should transition from what we call a worldwide system to a more internationally competitive system so that you can bring your money back all the time repatriation day should be any day you want as a company without paying this high hurdle rate. Um, the administration, I think, has different views on that point. So we're not just 28 and 25. We're farther mm -hmm. apart on the substance of what the tax base looks like. That's point one. Point two, uh, eight out of 10 businesses in America are not corporations. They're what mm -hmm. we call pass-throughs. Mm -hmm. They're subchapter S corporations. They're LLCs. They're, they're partnerships, sole proprietorships. 90% of Wisconsin businesses are like this. Their top effective tax rate is 44.6% now. Um, and so there's a concern that, that the president may only want to lower the corporate rate for the large corporations for C-Corps, that's 20% of American businesses, but leave a almost 45% top tax rate for all the other businesses, which consequently is where most of our jobs come from, small and medium-sized businesses. And so what we want to make sure is we bring both rates down and switch over to a very competitive system Dave Camp made a heroic effort at the Ways and Means Committee to put a, a version of reform out there. Um, the, there's a corporate side to it, and there's the individual small business side to it. Um, we've heard nothing from the administration in response. We've heard crickets. And so I think if there was a real, actual um, ur sense of urgency and priority to getting this done, we would probably hear more. But our partner we were working on with this issue, I think, I won't put words in his mouth, but 
I think saw a little frustration, and he's now the ambassador to China. So um, I didn't see the sense of urgency coming from the administration. I think Dave would probably say the same, Dave Camp. Um, but we have to tackle this issue. We will lose more companies. And if we just try to put up a barrier, put up a wall to try and trap companies in America with some of the legislation that's flowing around, all we'll do is accelerate foreign companies buying U.S. companies. And we don't want that either. So next January, would you urge the new chairman of the federal of the House Ways and Means Committee to make tax reform a top priority? Yeah. Yeah, yes. we think I think it's essential for you'll, our survival. And you'll for our commit to that now, Chairman Ryan, right? <laughs> Look, I, I, I don't like commenting on these things until <laughs> the right time. And but tax reform, what, what you're really saying is you can't just do corporate tax reform yeah. by itself. It has to be, uh, you know, much larger. That's right. I just mean, I want to invite everybody to jump in anytime you want to here, and I just want to throw out on the table without a specific question the issue of immigration mm -hmm. uh, and how important that is to everything we're talking about. Well, it's certainly a big issue. I mean, sitting in Silicon Valley, you know, we bring in students from around the world, particularly into our graduate programs. Um, we have a very large program in, in engineering and the sciences. Um, in the engineering now, half of the graduate students come from outside the U.S. We obviously make a big investment in educating them. Um, and the thought that they're going to leave without making a contribution to our economy, I think, is something that's really, a, really a mistake. So I, I'm in, I'm very much in the camp that we ought to find a way to accelerate this, to, to get a skills-based visa for these highly educated individuals in in key companies and in, in things we want. The alternative is companies are going to start hiring outside yeah. the U.S. because they can't get the talent inside the U.S. And while, you know, some people talk about the wage arbitrage issue, the big driver is talent. That's the big driver. And there is a worldwide, increasingly worldwide competition for the, for the best talent. Yeah, I agree with that. It is, it is quite amazing to see the number of foreign students in our graduate programs. I'd say in economics it's uh, 75, 80% uh, foreign-born students. And then, actually, it, we are able to keep some in the country, so it means that most of the assistant professors are also foreign born. So it's actually quite an influx of talent. Yeah, it's growing right. quickly, the number so, of uh, yeah. young academics who come from outside the United it States. It does also make you concerned about our own education system in the U.S. I mm -hmm. think that's another topic no, of, of importance important. related to the economics. <laughs> uh, one thing I'd just like to say, it seems to me tax reform is an example where it's urgent to do something. I mean, th this is no joke. I mean, I, I think the whole economic problem. We have had slow growth. Uh, the, the employment to population ratio isn't grown anywhere. We have, you know, San Francisco Fed's doing work on how wages for college graduates is, is declining. It's, it's like an urgent situation. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, it seems to me that the whole, you know, there is monetary policy, fiscal policy, regulatory policy, you're asking about tax reform. All those things should be like, we got to do this. This country is, is failing unless we make the change. And we aren't treated like, a, like an emergency, like an urgency at this point. I mean, the fact the White House is not considering anything that in the camp bill is ridiculous. It's, uh, it's, this is not partisan. This is something this country, it should be a wake-up call. I was, I was in the Treasury at 9-11. We thought that was going to be a wake-up call, and there were some good things done. We, that's where we started figuring out how to freeze terrorist assets, but it kind of dissipated, and I think policy is getting worse. On, on this economic policy is getting worse. So I. I I can't say the main message I'd like to convey is that this is urgent. We've got to do something about it. Let, let's come back to that in a second. But, John, you, you mentioned 9-11, and, and we were talking about immigration. Have we, did we overreact? Is it, are we making it too hard for some of, those, some of that talent to stay in America? I think there was a bit of overreaction. I know some, some people, uh, we could see that at the, at the start. I remember trying to get some people to help uh, with the economic side in Iraq, who were Iraq expats that happened to live in Australia. They had a huge time, tough time getting permission to come through. I think the, uh, there may have been, that, that, that whole event and the reaction yeah. may have led to problems which were just seen, and that may be one, but more generally, um, it led to kind of a, maybe put us a more intrusive, more interventionist style of, of government, maybe bigger government, as in it, maybe unintended consequences, and it may be that the economic policy that we're seeing now, which I do think is more interventionist and, and more somewhat more intrusive, and uh, problems with the rule of law, that may have come from that. You know, you, 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 there were questions that difficult questions had to be resolved, and 
and then the financial crisis itself led to a lot of uh, unusual interventions. Uh, bankruptcy law was overridden, and that maybe has continued. So, <clears throat> but whatever the reason is, I think policy is off track, and we need to really work together to find a, a way back. I want to get, get invite anybody to jump in any yeah. of this. Paul, we you got over the immigration problem. We did have a blip right after 9-11. There was a blip. But today, you know, we're taking in a few thousand international students every year. Mm -hmm. Two or three can't get visas. And if somebody, if somebody who's looking at security says, these are two or three students we shouldn't admit because they have some suspicious element in their background, that's fine. We're going we're gonna to trust that because that's a small But it's number. rare. It's not. Right. Paul, you have worked so hard on immigration. Yeah. Uh, really year. paid off. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 that's the question. I <laughs> so isn't, isn't that enormously frustrating? Doesn't that say something bad about both parties, uh -huh. about the paralysis mm -hmm. in Washington? Uh, it tests your patience, I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Um, sure. Uh, we have paralyzed government right now. Um, look, I can just be a Republican and point a bunch of fingers if you'd like me to. I know how to do that, but let's just, we have paralyzed government. Um, we have a crisis on the border right now that has uh, kept our focus on that and, and only that right now. And it's, it is another chapter of, for, for our members of how this administration isn't enforcing existing laws. So they lose confidence on moving forward on any other law making in this area. That's why you won't see immigration reform this year. Um, where the silly season starts earlier every cycle, the silly season being re-election. Uh, each year it seems earlier and earlier, and the governing time is shorter and shorter. And, uh, you know, unfortunately we're going to have to go through another round of elections and then uh, try and pick up where we left off. You think we can get a compromise on this, Congressman? It seems well, like skills, I don't think anybody really disagrees with that. Yeah, uh, I think it's that's, po that's political football. Yeah, nobody, like. very, very, we, there's a vast majority. We passed a skills bill last session out right. of uh, the House Republicans, the Chaffetz bill, um, where other immigration advocates uh, come down on that is, don't just pass that because then you can't pass the you other thing. So the they, other. they want just all or none. And when you ask for all or none, it's, it's, it usually ends up being none. And it, it seems yeah. like there are some nuggets, right? A piece of the DREAM Act that probably could be made acceptable well, to both sides. Well, right now, right we don't have the ability to do anything yeah. because of this border crisis, because of, of just the right. paralysis we have and the border crisis and the lack of confidence in the administration. That's our problem. Well, I, I'm not going to defend the administration. We talk about a border crisis. There are probably, what, one-tenth as many undocumented or illegals coming across that border as came across 10 years ago? I mean, that's not a crisis. Well, I think the economy has more to do with that. Well, no, uh, it does, but we talk about a border crisis. Mm -hmm. We have 90,000 maybe at most, and we had 800,000 Oh, back I think in, this rises to the level of a humanitarian crisis. 800,000 Because they're kids. Years ago. I, think I think that's the issue. Oh, I think it's a they're human crisis. Through Mexico. No, 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 it's a human crisis, but it really isn't a, a, an immigration or border crisis, is it? Whatever you want to call it, we're not doing immigration <laughs> reform right. this year because... Right. Uh, there is just an utter lack of confidence in the administration because of how they've mishandled this particular okay. crisis or whatever it is you want to call it. If you brought a bill to the House floor, could it pass right now? No, it I don't think so. Oh, well, what are you talking about? The, the, something, something like the Senate No, I don't bill? think that's I don't think so. We were, I think you could have answered that question in the affirmative before this. Before up. this. Uh, but this brewed up, and no, I don't think you could. Uh, right now, we're trying to figure out how to, we want to change the 08 law, which is to make sure that non-contiguous countries are treated the same as contiguous countries. Mm -hmm. Um, we do realize that there are assets needed on the border, um, but there are a lot of other things that we think ought to be done to better secure the border, and that's where the debate is kind of hovering around right now, and that's mm -hmm. about as finite as it's going to get this, this year. Does America have the same innovative spirit that we had 20 years ago, 30 years ago? People certainly do. I mean, you know, we're from Silicon Valley. <laughs> I, I, have, I mean, it's every day you see it. You, you, you talk to students, you talk to people who are involved with Stanford in different ways, people who watch my, uh, my online course. It, there's, it's out there. It's a, it's a tremendous uh, creativity, wanting to do things. Uh, I, don't think, I, don't, I don't think we should sell that short. I think, you know, there's this view that uh, the economy has sort of moved into this secular stagnation and growth is going to be low and the new you know, normal. We picked up all the low-hanging fruit. It's only mm -hmm. high-hanging fruit out there. I just, I just don't believe that. I, there's a, the cover of the Economist magazine this week has a picture of a big turtle. That's the yeah. U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. And there's somebody on the back of the turtle trying to get it to go. And, of course, turtle's not going to go anywhere. So it's a kind of a depressing picture to me. 
I, I think they should put on the picture a sleeping giant. The American economy is a sleeping giant. And it needs to be awakened. And I think it just has so much potential with the change in policy and the right policies. So, no, I think the people, and we, and we have uh, influx uh, from abroad as, as we normally do. We could do more of that. But I'm, I'm quite optimistic that if we get the policy right, we'll be able to get back to, to growth rates uh, like we've seen in the past. Just, just remember, this, this recovery has been unbelievably slow. And it, and it followed a deep recession and, uh, and a crisis. So it's not good. And there's an enormous amount of improvement, I think, that's, that's possible. And again, I, I've always focused on the policy as a problem. As people come to agree that we have a problem of growth, they've listed these other things, like the secular stagnation. I, don't, I think that's the wrong way to go. We, we, do, we just have lots of evidence about the policy being a problem. And people don't want to talk about it that much. I don't know why. Um, Maybe it's because they think the policy is fine, but I don't think it is. Paul? I totally agree with that. Uh, I think if we do just a handful of things, we will really see st strong economic growth. Um, I think em immigration reform ultimately is an economic issue after you get to the rule of law and the border security and that stuff. That's an economic issue because we have baby boomers retiring right. and we have fewer people following them into the workforce. And that, that speaks to growth, uh, tax reform, get our fiscal consolidation get this budget under control, reform our entitlements so that they're ready for the 21st century, get those unfunded liabilities off the books so that we know that investment horizons are stable. You'll take pressure off the Federal Reserve. You'll take pressure off the dollar. You'll have a stronger dollar. Get a couple of trade agreements that are worth getting, and we're up and running. Uh, and tame the regulatory state because right now, of all the complaints I hear from businesses, taxes is up there, but regulations is what I hear constantly. So as members of Congress, you're sort of walking focus groups. You talk... I do factory tours all the time in southern Wisconsin. Uh, it's regulation, regulation, regulation. What is the government going to do to me next? I just don't know. I'm sitting on my money. That's, that's the biggest part of the uncertainty that's out there. If you just get those things under control, and I would add energy policy to that, you'll turn this economy around. You'll get us growing. And the, the frustration for us is we, we, we've proposed specific solutions on this. We've passed bills specifically dealing with this. I think the number is 305 bills we passed in the House already this, this session, um, but they're just dying and they're going nowhere. And I understand some people don't like them and there might be controversial, but there's not even like something coming from the other side that they pass that then we start talking. We're just, that's, all, that's where we are. And that's really frustrating to House Republicans. So I think, Al, you, you talk to the young people that are coming into college now. Their innovative drive, their entrepreneurial bent, it's very much alive. They're out there. They want to go out and change the world. There was a, a Fortune article about this young woman who left Stanford from her undergraduate degree who's going to reinvent the way we do lab tests on people. And so you go, instead of having to go and send your blood into lab, you go down to your wo local Walgreens and you get the answer in 10 minutes. Hmm. Right? So, and she's building a technology to do that that she really believes in and it's really going to change the world. That kind of drive to kind of do that and create new technologies and take what we know, it's very much alive, very much alive. The specter of China, does that have any relevance to what we're talking about? Very much so. Um, yeah, I, I went there in April and met with a lot of the leaders. Uh, they're very confident. Um, I think they see us on the downward slide. Um, I think our military budget that the president's proposal has proposed has whetted their appetite and given them the impression they can catch up with us. I think that's a big mistake. Um, they have reinterpreted their a mistake their, on their part or a mistake on, on their, their part. part. They're, we're, we're by shrinking our navy to pre World War One levels, shrinking our army to pre World War Two levels, and shrinking our air force to a level we've never seen before. You are you are giving the sense that they can catch up to us militarily, so they'll try even harder to do so. In my opinion. Uh, second, I think they've 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 got themselves in a very forward-leaning position with respect to their neighbors, where they're reinterpreting international boundary waters with this nine-dash line. And that's why you see these disputes in the South and East China Sea, um, where you have a lot of our allies, whether it's the Philippines or the Japanese or the Koreans, very nervous, the Vietnamese, very nervous about an expanse of China that is not good for the free flow of goods and commerce through this very important part of, of the country. And that's why our Navy and our alliances have to be even stronger than they are now. And I worry we're going in the wrong direction. So we, we have to have a good answer 
for a China policy that brings China into the world economy, into playing by the rules, not trying to rewrite them to meet their own, their own needs. And that's, that's the challenge of our generation right now. I think there, we're going to have face formidable competition. Um, got a large population, highly capable. They get the entrepreneurial thing, unlike some other parts of Asia where it never took. They more, absolutely more, did. Much more than Japan did. Much, much more, more than, than Japan. Yeah. And in fact, when I look at Japan and the big threat we faced in the 70s and early 80s from Japan, which we overcame, and we overcame through that innovation agenda by startup comp new companies coming on the horizon, creating yeah, jobs as a congressman. proved to be a, this monolithic. In yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And they never got it. That's not true in China. You see these people, they're highly entrepreneurial, they're moving ahead. I think the government is aligning its resources. Um, they realize that they have to have universities that compete with the best U.S. universities. And I think you're going to see, they're going to begin bumping off the institutions in Europe first in terms of pecking order, and then they'll be coming after us. And I think they're, they're going to do it. They're going to have the people, they're going to have the talent base. The, the recent uh, efforts on reforms, I think, are important to point out here, too. They're, it's actually, they're emphasizing markets more than ever. It's, I, I sometimes say, hey, we're moving away from markets. They're moving to markets, just right backwards from what you, what you think. Also trying to deal with the corruption. It's a tough, <coughs> tough one, but they're, you know, crony capitalism, whatever you want to call that. They're, it's a big problem there, and, and they're working on it. I think they have some kind of macro problems. they got a bit of a bubble in the, in the housing market that they're, Concerned about a lot of people moving to the cities who don't really have uh, ownership rights. Uh, their de demography is a, a bit of a problem. But um, no, I agree. It's they're, they're moving in directions which exploit their talents and uh, very much entrepreneurial spirit. And in the context of our conversation, India. India's problem is it has the talent base, but so many other things don't work well in the country. I mean, corruption is a much bigger problem. Yeah. Uh, infrastructure's broken. Um, <clears throat> you know, you look at these IITs that are the jewel of the country. You know, all the IITs together graduate about as many engineers as the state of California graduates. So given the size of their country, they haven't been able to make the investments. They have lots of faculty positions open. If they could get that aligned and really begin to make it work, they would become they would become a challenge. But they got a lot of the new, 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 new leadership is promising. They have yeah, new leadership. New leadership. So, yeah, new new leadership. leadership. New leadership. So let's yeah. let's, let's yeah. some hope. Yeah. 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 Um, let's throw it open to questions here. Do we have a microphone, or are we just going to speak with a loud, distinct voice? A loud, distinct voice. Who's got? I see a question. We have microphones. Oh, we have mic. A question in the back. Could you identify yourself, if you don't mind? <laughs> uh, <can> you, <laughs> yep. you didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> what about human capital? I mean, I'd sort of returns on human capital. I mean, uh, it seems to me that uh, at least at K through 12 levels that uh, we're really uh, setting ourselves up for some major problems. Uh, comments from any of you? So I, I think education, uh, which human capital uh, increases, is, uh, is an economic issue. Um, I think we've failed a large part of our population in this area. We're failing continually. Um, I think it's related to the issues of income distribution, where basically if you want to deal with that, you deal with that lower 20, 30 percent or whatever that aren't getting those opportunities. Um, so I think it, it's, it's really a, uh, to me, it's a no-brainer policy, but it's just very hard to do something about it. It's just very frustrating. I think um, <clears throat> more freedom of choice would help a lot, mm -hmm. more opportunities, charter schools, uh, uh, more demanding standards uh, for, for teachers, all those things, which, you know, we have a lot of research done at Hoover, John, on this, and I think it's uh, one of those no-brainers. One of those frustrating things for me, quite frankly, as, a, as someone involved in education, to see how... We seem to be doing okay at Stanford, but this, the rest of the, you know, K-12 especially in certain parts of, of our country is, is really a problem. Yeah, John, especially the common for the core, core well, for, both, for, the for all three of you, the common core standards are a good or bad idea? I think the common core standard is a good idea in the long term. The, the shock to the system, we're going to have lots of kids who can't meet that standard initially because we've been underinvesting, particularly for lower income kids. You can't just take a whole generation of kids and throw them out because we're raising the standard, but not yet raising the investment rate. Better teacher core, 
teacher quality matters and you know the US does not recruit its teachers from the most talented school kids and by the way we also invest less to educate a teacher than we invest to educate an engineer a politician an economist and we ought to, we ought to fix that I think if you can bring all these pieces together and you probably need to invert the nation's investment right now if you look at a, a child who comes from an income district that's a higher middle class, upper middle class, upper income. We spend more to educate that kid in K-12 than we spend for kids in low income districts. But the kid in the low industry, income district is the one who starts out two grade levels behind when they walk into school. And, and we've got to somehow make the investment to catch them up. Full year school, longer school day, uh, thinking about how we make all those less things reliance work. on property taxes or support yes of? less reliance on property taxes I think we, and you know California is now moving away from that I think we're gonna have more states that have to move away from it well I'm, yeah. I'm not a fan of the Common Core uh, not because I don't want standards I just don't think it's a, the, the right level of, of government I don't think yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I want the federal government in this space uh, because I I've watched the federal government um, I <laughs> see what they do I worry what will federalize curriculum and we'll dumb it down uh, so I'm not a fan of it for federalism reasons. Yeah. Um, but, and I'll have a lot more to say on this on Thursday, uh, John, about this particular issue in space. But let's just know that there are a whole generation of people slipping through the cracks in society. We have a 20th century welfare system that is not working for the 21st century. We have a poverty trap that in many ways, inadvertently, um, is trapping people in poverty and is, and is holding people from becoming upper mobile, from getting better lives. And so we need to take a wholesale look at our approach to this and think it through all over again. Because what we are doing now isn't working. We have, hot, we have 92 programs in the federal government spending $800 billion a year with a goal of you know, fighting poverty. And we've been doing this for 50 years. We had the same poverty rates effectively that we've had when we started. So we need to think this through again. And I would argue that the government-centered hodgepodge of alphabet soup agencies approach isn't working. It's not outcome-based, it's input-based. How much money are we spending? How many people are we putting on programs? How many programs are we creating? And it's not outcome-based. How many people are getting out of poverty? So to your point about human capital, look at these horrible labor participation rates. Look at how many people just stopped looking for work. Look at how many people, you know, there are jobs here and there, but they're not being connected. And look at the skills gap. So to me, it's not just come up with a new silver bullet idea or a neat little program. It's take a look at all that we're already doing and see what we could do a lot better using those principles that made us a special country in the first place, which is um, bring it down to the local level, to the local person. And I'll, I'll leave it at that because I'm going to spend a lot of time on this on Thursday. Yeah. This but is a journalist delight. Finally, some disagreement, is, a little bit of a disagreement here. Yeah. So, John, you get to break the, you're, you're the tiebreaker now. Common Core, good or bad idea? Well, I agree with Paul about this notion that the, somehow the central government is yeah. going to... Yeah, yeah right. I mean, I, I admit to the same concern. On the other oh, hand... Oh, wait a minute. On the, the other hand, on the other hand, in the end, I'd rather have a common standard across the country, even if it implies a little federal interference with the system. Are you with President Hennessy or Chairman Ryan? I already said. Um, you want me to... Oh, no, okay, okay, okay. No, no actually... So <laughs> Two to one. The, one of the, let me tell you, there's some things that I, I have some specifics about this. Um, it turns out the Common Core has had the effect of postponing the time that students in California take uh, Algebra One yeah. a year. Yeah. Um, that seems counterproductive to me. I, you can't know if it's exactly the reason, but it, it's related to that. That seems to be exactly the word. That's, that's dumbing down. We don't want to do that. <clears throat> right, right here in the front row. Sure. You know. the yeah, here it comes. Okay, well, He's got the camera. Thanks, so uh, I'm Tim Kane, recently joined, joined uh, Hoover. I wanted to ask, we started out thinking about innovation, and uh, I, I've been amazed doing some economic research, something that we've looked at at Hoover. Brookings Institution put out a report recently, found the same thing. The number of startup companies on a per capita basis is declining. Startup companies create about three million jobs a year, and so John, you, you spoke about the regulatory environment, and I'm wondering, you know, when, especially when we look at labor force participation rates, these aren't the Googles where we're from, right? These aren't the, the big heavy startups. Right. But if somebody has to pay an extra fifty thousand dollars because of regulation to start a small retail retail store in Toledo, Ohio, or, or somewhere in Wisconsin, 
it's no surprise then that we see fewer of these. Is, is there an emergency around that, and what can be done to roll back that regulatory state? I, well, I think you were you asking John or? Yeah, well, both of you. So yes and yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You put it very well, Jim. I hope. Yeah. yeah. But I think it's perfect. Yeah. You know, operationally, what can be done? Well, so I'll, I'll just give the, the legislative answer to that, which is um, the regulators are off on a tear right now. And I believe that the second term of this president, that's pretty much what their plan is, because they don't have high hopes for passing the kind of legislation they would like to pass. So they're stacking the regulatory agencies with people with this, you know, with the nuclear option in the Senate, uh, and or at least that's the, going to be the attempt. And they're regulating, you know, without a lot of authority. I would argue. I think the EPA reg that came out with 111D stretches things a bit. Um, we think we should have these come back to Congress for final vote and approval. Um, a number of state legislatures do this. The problem with modern government today is. You think your congressman is writing the laws that you live under, and it's really a bureaucrat you've never met that you never voted for. And your congressman you can go to to complain about this regulation that's really affecting your life. And what he might do is write a nasty letter to the bureaucrats hoping that they can, you know, take the concern under consideration. That, that's kind of the government we have today. We think, we call it the RAINS Act, we think <coughs> on large rules that, that have, you know, impacts over, I think, $50 million. Uh, they had to come back to Congress for a final vote, approval, or amendment before they become effective, like a lot of state legislatures do, so that the laws jibe with the original intent that the law writers, lawmakers that you voted for uh, see. I think that brings um, some more accountability to the system, um, and not to mention just the Paperwork Reduction Act, OIRA, which is this sort of moribund agency over at OMB, get them to do real cost-benefit analysis and, and open this stuff up, open up their black box, so peer reviewers, so economists can actually see how they do this cost-benefit analysis so we can actually see if it's really truly weighing the cost benefits or if it's, you know, somebody for, for whatever reason putting their thumb on the scale for some predetermined outcome that they're hoping to achieve. We have, I saw one back there in the back. I don't want to, Paul, you noticed I moved to my left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's reflexive, <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> Partner at Egon Zender. And we had a, um, an interesting panel um, a couple of weeks ago. We had the, the CEO from one, or actually a board member from one of the U.S.'s biggest companies, industrial firm. We had a CEO of one of Latin America's biggest firms. We had a CEO of one of uh, India's biggest firms. And each of these people independently brought up the topic of how they relate to governments. They were all, they didn't really have a, a good sense of how to do that well. They felt under... Uh, pressure with the regulatory side. They knew that governments had become a much bigger stakeholder for them. They didn't know how to do it. Do you have any suggestions? I mean, what should companies be doing now to engage better with governments? Support limited government politicians. Sorry, <laughs> 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 right, I had to. <laughs> John, you, you're here in Washington for two days. Uh, what advice would you give them? I, I think it's, it's hard. I think you've got to, you've got, I think the lesson for Silicon Valley companies has been you can't ignore Washington. Partly because of the regulatory burdens and things coming out, partly that you do need issues around tax reform, you, uh, partly that there are things happening that you care about. So the lesson in the Valley for many years, the Valley's view was we don't worry about Washington, they don't bother us, we don't bother them. But that no longer works, particularly as these companies become global international companies. So I think you have to engage. You've yeah, got to make the investment. My fear with this trend, which, which is really there, is this is what becomes stagnation and cronyism. Um, those startups, they're not going to have a leg in the door. No. They're not going to have the ear of a legislator or a regulator. You know, so my big fear with this is everybody coming in, you just hit this enmeshed, you know, we, we call it crony capitalism today, whatever, they'll become called corporate welfare tomorrow, but it's sort of big, sluggish, unaccountable, you know, muddy government uh, that's not transparent it, with big business sort of rigging the rules, uh, setting the, the barriers to entry, and you have a, a non-dynamic economy. You don't have startups, and you, you have barriers to entry that make it harder for would-be competitors to get in and compete because they, they just feel like, I better get involved. I better get, you know, a big lobby shop. I better get, you know, a D.C. office, and I better get involved because if I, if I don't, it's at my own peril. 
That's what we're reinforcing today with the kind of government we have right now. And it means we won't have the kind of dynamic economic growth and upward mobility that we have had in the past that we need in the future. Going on the theme of uh, startup companies, and uh, want to ask about intellectual property laws. Mm -hmm. And are our nation's intellectual property laws, are we still the trendsetter around the world? Mm -hmm. And talk to us a little bit about uh, those from Silicon Valley, especially, but uh, Congressman as well, future chairman as well, uh, about uh, the patent IP laws and um, uh, you know venture capital money declining in near term. What does that mean for our competitiveness, and what does that mean for startups, and what does that mean for next generation Googles of the world? You know, in the in the IP sector, I think we face two different two different problems. We do have a we do have a problem uh, with some trolls out there that we've got to address that and figure out a way to do that. And partly, this is due to the fact that in some areas our patent law is just outmoded. So when you start talking about software mm -hmm. patents. It is a mess beyond belief, and and we're, we're, that's an area where we need either improvements in the patent office to really think about how those standards should move forward and how those laws should dictate behavior in the 21st century as opposed to the 18th or 19th century. Um, and then there's the international issue. What do we do about international patent violations and people who set up business basically copying American products and destroying our intellectual property? You know, one of the scariest things is when we had a series of cyber intrusions in the valley, and it was clear. They were going after product designs. They were in, trying to get into companies in the valley, breaking in. This is something we've got to figure out what our national policy to protect our interests and to protect our companies is going to be. We need trade agreements to enforce yeah. IP. And uh, if we stand still on trade, we're falling behind, and others are going to write the rules for the road. Thank you. Um, my name is Cliff Winston. I'm with Brookings. And a, a comment uh, for your reaction. I think that we're actually further along with innovation than people realize, and that the more fundamental problem, or a fundamental problem, is there are a lot of innovations that are actually available and can be implemented. And either government isn't implementing them when they should, in terms of public sector services, or they're slowing things up for the private sector to do it. And the implications are we're not only denied the benefits of those innovations, but then there are alternative policies that are pursued that are quite inefficient. So let me back this mm. up. Highways. You know, we're mm. struggling over a highway bill. You know, people have no idea. There are an amazing number of innovations that have taken place using GPS and so on and so forth that can radically improve traffic now, reduce you know, the demands on capacity. In real time, measure what trucks are carrying, yeah. could charge them for damaging the roads, can adjust lanes depending on traffic volumes, you know, can go on, all sorts of things like that. Federal Highway doesn't implement any of those, doesn't use any of those things, even though they can be put in right now. Air traffic control, you know about, obviously, the satellite-based yep. air traffic control system would dramatically change air travel in ways that people don't even realize, and all these things are making everything, everything safer. So alternatively, what do we hear? High-speed rail, which obviously is a grossly inefficient form that, that you know, we would need if we did these other innovations. But the big ticket item, the most important thing that we're not encouraging is the driverless car. Yep. That's the game changer right there. That would dramatically reduce pressure on highway capacity, improve safety. This is something that government should be trying to help and spur. Mm. Instead, what do we hear? Concerns about liability, the FBI is piping up about all this. These, you know, and this is just, my area of transportation. You know, this is N things that I'm talking about, things that could be done that aren't done, and then you have these crazy alternatives that are ex extremely costly. That's what's got to change. So I, I agree with you 100% on this issue. I mean, the, the, key, the key question I've been asking people about driverless car on the regulation side is, how much better does my driverless car need to be than the average driver before it's acceptable? Right? I think today you can probably match the average driver. 
and that's when the average driver has if you're had a drink or isn't falling asleep, yeah. right? For Wisconsin. But how much better? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Wisconsin, yeah. right? Hey, they have a line of kugels and they drive, yeah. you know, who knows what happens. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but that's, the, that's what we ought to be saying. What are we willing to accept as a society? We accept that human drivers make mistakes all the time, right? All the time. And then they do bad behaviors, too. You know, the good thing is the driverless car never has any alcohol, never falls asleep. So we can get, we can get a standard that I think will impress it. Hmm. We already have this for airplanes, right? For airplanes, autopilot landing is better than pilot, than pilot manually controlled landing. It is better, right? And the only time you want to shut it off is when there's a major malfunction in the system of some sort. So we've got to get comfortable with this and think, you know, it might not be that human control is always the best way to do it. Actually, this is one of those examples I was saying before. You hear, if you're in Silicon Valley, you hear this all, all sorts yeah. of ideas about this all the time. You know, it's you, there are these frustrations and these potential restrictions, but it, and you combine it with Uber, you don't need parking lots anymore. It's just it's an amazing it change. It's so uh, it, it's so it's 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 there's a lot of buzz about it. That's for sure. Yeah. What I more? got out of that was Brookings said that high speed rail is grossly inefficient. <laughs> you like that? Well, I think that's the like that. takeaway. <laughs> Back there. We have a microphone there. I think they're giving me the hook after this. Yeah. My name is Greg Sidek. I'm creature in economics. Uh, over the last decade or so, some of the most prominent antitrust uh, cases that the government has taken on have involved high tech. On balance, is this stimulating or retarding innovation? John Taylor. So the cases I know, um, I mean, there's the e-books case. I guess that's the one that's got a lot of publicity with Apple. I, I think it's it, that would have been just fine to just let go. I, I don't think that's uh, was so productive for the government to be involved with. I think in general. Um, it's very hard for them to do high tech issues. It's, they move so quickly, and so yeah. I, this is maybe my just general instincts here. Is uh, that's an area where they probably should be a little more laissez-faire about the whole, about the technology. You know, it's a tricky thing because you sometimes see firms um, using approaches where they're bundling an advantage they have in one sector to stomp out competition in another sector, and and, and this is the the fear, I think, particularly if that other sector is a young startup company, right? And that's the classic example. So that has to be balanced against, I agree with John, things move quickly. And um, not creating a long-term regulatory burden, which then slows down the sector or significant players in the sector long term, <laughs> but, but does give some protection for the, for the young startups. I well, think. what are a couple ways you could provide that protection, John? I, I think you've got to you've got to pay attention to a few companies whose position in a core required sector is so dominant um, that they have an obligation in the other sector. Now today it happens part of the place where you get protection that I think actually works is the review on acquisitions. So you there are certain companies you can't go out and buy because they would enhance your dominant position in a sector you're already dominant. It seems to me some of those issues, the, some of those regulations actually do make sense in terms of increasing competition. But in the end, I don't think we want to, we don't want to become Europe. The purpose of antitrust is in the end to ensure that the consumer is better served. Not that we necessarily preserve the competitiveness of a company which perhaps is, is not competitive for, it, it hasn't made the right technology decisions, the right investments. So that's, that's the key balance. Well, I want to thank everybody, and I want to thank the audience, too, because um, obviously you didn't spend too much time at that, uh, at that bar beforehand because your <laughs> questions were very rational. So that affords you the opportunity to do it right now. Uh, and I particularly want to thank Paul Ryan and John Hennessy and John Taylor for a really interesting, provocative uh, conversation. Thank you so much. Happy to be here.